Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of Simpol Insights, a series of interviews with today's leading thinkers in the field of civilization design, collective intelligence, and conscious evolution. In a world confronted with global warming, pandemics, increasing inequality, and political polarization, Simpol Insights aims to bring light to the darkness and chart a course towards a cooperative global society. I'm your host, Robert Cobbold, and today's guest is Simon Anholt. Simon Anholt has advised the presidents, prime ministers, monarchs, and governments of nearly 60 countries, cities, and regions, helping them to engage more productively and imaginatively with the international community. He's recognized as the world's leading authority on national image and has produced several indexes to rank how countries are perceived around the world. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Robert. Um, now, the first question might seem like an obvious uh, one, particularly um, uh, to people like me and you that think an awful lot about uh, cooperation. Um, but why should a national government care about their national image? Well, it, it is an interesting question. I think a lot of people, and perhaps particularly people in government administration, have a feeling that national image is somehow something rather superficial, that the job of governments is to think about deeds and policies and actions and not to worry about how they're regarded. It's about half and half, I would say. About half the governments care desperately and about half of them think they shouldn't. And they're both right and they're both wrong. The reality of the matter is that the country's image feeds into its progress and prosperity in so many different ways that they become almost inseparable. So to, to put it bluntly, a country that's got a powerful and positive image finds that everything is easy and everything is cheap. So if you want more tourists, you want more investors, you want more talent, you don't really have to try very hard if you've got a great image because everybody knows that's where they want to invest or visit or, 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 or migrate. Countries with weak or negative images find that everything is difficult and everything is expensive. You're constantly having to tell people that it's not what they think, that you're better than they imagine. And Honestly, it's that difference in image, which as much as anything else is increasing global inequality because it tears apart the rich world from the poor world. The rich countries have generally speaking all got very good images, so they find more growth, more prosperity, even easier. And the poor countries not only have to fight against weak infrastructure and weak institutions and weak economies and weak societies very often, they're also having to battle against the headwind of a negative reputation and it pulls the two apart. So this is serious stuff. It's not, uh, it's not trivial at all. I'm a huge fan of game theory and that has informed a lot of my work and in informed a lot of Simpol as well um, mm. and the idea behind Simpol. Um, and it seems like it was, uh, I was all the way through reading the book, I was just thinking about game theory and indirect reciprocity. And that seems to, how much has that informed your work? And, and why did you decide to sort of leave it out the book or, 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 or how, you know, how does that relate to your thinking about all this stuff? It's very good of you to assume that I deliberately left it out. It was pure ignorance. It's, <laughs> a, it's a topic of which I know very little and it hasn't really formed a, a serious part of my, uh, of my thinking on this subject. Although, of course, um, you can come at this subject from so many different angles. You can come at it from an international relations angle, which is basically what I did. You can come at it from a marketing and image angle, although that can lead you down completely the wrong path. But, you know, there are only a few truths in the world. And sooner or later, if you're thinking hard about a subject, you're going to bump up against all of them. <laughs> um, well, yeah, check it out. Yeah, I'm a big, I'm a huge fan of game theory. I've written... Um, articles called uh you know why nice guys finish first and it basically mm. it's exactly it's everything that you're saying about the the dynamics i know that I, I do know the basics but i'm just not a i couldn't claim to be an expert on it okay um so you've recently written the book uh, the good country equation how we can repair the world in one generation and uh i loved it truly uh, I really, really enjoyed it. It speaks to all sorts of, um, well, th this idea of global cooperation is something that I'm so passionate about. And so that's what Simpol is all about. And you managed to straddle this lovely line between, um, you know, talking about very serious things, but in a kind of playful manner. Um, and you don't, you, you sort of refrain from um, any kind of finger wagging or moralizing. It manages to be kind of optimistic and upbeat, but at the same time, quite pragmatic. Um, and, and it's full of hilarious anecdotes about you traveling around the world and meeting governments and funny conversations that you've had. Um, and it, my personal favorite was uh, uh, what happened when you found yourself locked in the palace at Bhutan. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you mind just uh, explaining uh, that story? Because I, I thought it was hilarious. 
Well, I was in Bhutan and um, on a on a UN mission, and we were advising the the government of Bhutan about uh, how it could manage its um, its its international profile better. And incidentally, with gross national happiness, it did an extraordinarily good job of it. Subsequently, I can't claim the credit for that, but uh, what a wonderful illustration of how, in our modern age, a very small and in traditional in a traditional sense weak country can achieve enormous salience globally just by having something to offer the rest of the world that the world wants and needs and that's really what it all boils down to well the story um yeah i got locked in a lavatory um <laughs> i was supposed to be giving a talk to a bunch of officials and they were all politely sitting in the room waiting for me to turn up in my own good time and after about 40 minutes <laughs> they began to realize that something had happened so in the end, they had to break down the door and release me. But the biggest challenge of all wasn't how to get out, but was how to behave when I did get out. Because, you know, these people had been sitting there for a really long time. And of course, one is always conscious of and slightly wary of cultural differences. And I just for the life of me couldn't decide whether it was better to pretend that nothing had happened or whether to try and make a joke of it, bearing in mind that toilet humor is not the most universal. <laughs> but in the in the end, I managed to twist it into my lecture. I made a moral parable out of it. Did they find it funny? I have no way of knowing. I mean, the <laughs> Bhutanese are absolutely charming and delightful people, and um, they were enormously friendly. But nobody ever mentioned what had happened. Perhaps they didn't want to embarrass you or something. I think not. I think that's it. <laughs> Um, but that that uh, that humour comes through the book in lots of ways, and it's not just um, not just the way you write that's quite funny, but actually even the way that you conduct these negotiations has a really fun, playful element to it. So some of my favourite um, sort of policy ideas that you came up with was um, uh, trying to persuade uh, the Faroe Islands to invite the entire population of the Maldives to come and live in the Faroe Islands after their island disappears because of climate change. Or um, or that it wasn't didn't the Botswana government was trying to show the world that their their um, demo democratic elections were fair and accountable and so you suggested that, that they were suggesting have it inviting people to inspect their elections and you said no no you should you should send your officials to inspect the US elections and make sure they're fair and accountable mm. um, so why the question is why do you think it's it's important to keep a sort of certain amount of ima imagination and playfulness in those kind of discussions and ideas and and why do you why do you make people come to them without wearing ties and why do you make them sing and why do you think that's all important um, for two reasons. I think one, one is just personal taste. I have a sort of a motto, which is just because these things are serious doesn't mean they have to be boring. Um, and the second reason is connected to that. The reason why things mustn't be boring is because you can't engage people if they're boring. And the problem with politics and particularly international politics is that it's been dominated for so long by such, um, such dreariness. And um, I think the lack of a sense of humor in uh, policy making circles is actually quite a serious problem. There's a convention, as I say in the, in the book, an unwritten convention that people who work in governments should always leave their heart and their soul in the fridge when they come to work in the morning. And this is actually a really serious problem because it means that they don't bring the useful parts of themselves to bear when they're discussing important matters. You can see why they do it. It's not hard to understand because you know they're spending their lives working on on, on factors that are, going to, um, that are going to affect the lives and the livelihoods of millions of people. And then they make the fatal error of assuming that as a result of that, the safest thing for them to do is to be utterly conventional and never to come up with anything that doesn't strongly resemble something that's already been done before. And actually, particularly in the modern world, that's the most dangerous thing you can do because policies must resonate. They must capture people's imagination. Otherwise, politics becomes more and more and more um, removed from the daily experience and the daily taste of ordinary people and the split between the decision makers and the victims of those decisions becomes wider and wider. So in a sense what I'm saying is that um, publics, citizens, voters, whatever you want to call them, they have to regain that space and shape it in their own way. Sometimes it is funny, it needs to be funny, or at least it needs to be creative. I, I've, I've said at least three times in the book, my definition of that simple word creative is just, it's the opposite of boring. That's all I mean. It doesn't have to be ha-ha, roll over, laughing, but it just has to be engaging. And that's why, you know, I tell people, it's only a silly thing, but when they, when they come to the, the meetings, what I call conversation, 
they're not allowed to wear ties because the tie restricts the oxygen supply to the brain and it impedes um, creative thinking. And they've just got to dump all that outside the door and just think like human beings. Mm. I think, I mean, that, that, I think that could inform so much change efforts as well, not necessarily just, you know, policy making or international negotiations, but any kind of change making, any activism um, can really benefit from a much more lighthearted approach. So I really, that was, I found that very refreshing. Um, mm. You, you, central to the book is this idea of a dual mandate um, that, mm. that national leaders or any leaders, in fact, have a responsibility not just to the people that they represent to make life in their country better, but also to the rest of the world and the international community. Um, mm. And you, you make the point quite rightly that they can't always easily be separated. Um, and yet mm. it does seem that on, on the biggest issues, like, for example, nuclear disarmament or like climate change, um, mm. too often they're not aligned those two things. So mm. you have a situation where Macron tries to raise the fuel taxes and gets hammered by his his voters and, and, mm. uh, and the Gilets Jaunes, or, or, or Trump pulls out of the Paris Climate Accord because, um, you know, to a lot of American voters find it not in their national interest, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm. so you know, why is it, do you think, that on the biggest issues, they're not aligned? And how do you think we could we could bring them together a bit more? Sometimes it's because they're not being imaginative enough with the solutions. In a surprising number of cases, it's because the, the way that these issues are framed is that there's only one way to respond to this scenario. You either, you either do A or you do B. And that just sort of increases this sense of everything being a zero-sum game. Um, and very often it's not the case. If, you, if you're just there when the decisions are being made and you encourage people to just pull them apart a bit and just think, is there a third option? Because very often if you're only looking at option A or option B, it's really true. Option A benefits your own people. Option B benefits other people's people. It's a choice. Who are you interested in? Are you interested in your own voters or are you interested in 7 billion other people who can't vote for you? And the answer is obvious. But so often you just say, well, let's just see if there isn't another one. Isn't there a C that somehow combines the two and actually ends up benefiting loads of people and is actually at the same time slightly more innovative, slightly more unfamiliar and will connect you to your population because you're doing surprising and extraordinary things. And that's what I found over and over again. But more than anything else, what I've found is this absolute assumption on the part of policymakers, no matter what their background, no matter, no matter what their antecedents, whether they're left wing, right wing, or Lord knows what, as soon as they get into the position where they're having to make decisions on behalf of a country, they seem to fall into the same basic universal belief. that Everything you do that's good for your people must be bad for somebody else. Anything you do that's good for the planet must be bad for your own economy. And it's extraordinary how unwilling they are to unpick or challenge that. I have conversations with politicians all the time and they insist on talking about all policy as if it were either one or the other. And I just sort of say to them, well, let, let's just have a look at this. Which policy are you talking about? Some of them are rather zero sum. There are some policies where it is, of course, a stark dichotomy between whether you favor your own people or whether you favor somebody else's people. Of course it is. But in more cases than you imagine, it's actually much more varied and more complex than that. And I suppose what I've found as a policy advisor over the years is that there's a whole universe of imaginative policy making there, which most policymakers have never even dreamt of because they've never even tried. They just assume before they start that it's A or B and there's nothing you can do about it. The defeatism is staggering. And, and at the moment you're in discussion with lots of different countries to try and find out what those C options are. Um, yeah. And how important is it, do you think, that those, when you find a good C option, that those, that those policies, those dual mandate policies are implemented simultaneously by more than one country? It's, it's important for all kinds of reasons. Uh, first of all, because it's very unlikely that it'll be effective if only one country uh, operates it. And I mean, really effective on, a, on, on the international dimension. Um, you, you know, my, my simple diagnosis of what's wrong with the world is that the challenges we're facing are known to us. We know what the solutions are. It's not that we're mystified by how you fix climate change. We know perfectly well how you fix climate change and pandemics and everything else. The problem is that uh, the resources required to fix them are bigger than any individual country and therefore collaboration is required. That's pretty simple and uh, pretty straightforward. But the question why then um, countries don't collaborate when they obviously need to that's really where, where we start getting involved in these interesting questions. Part of it, as I said before, or perhaps the largest part of it, is just the culture of governance. Um, that, you know, since the Treaty of Westphalia, and in fact, long before, countries have been configured 
as warring competing tribes whose interests uh, never overlap or will, will always overlap. Um, but, um, you know, I, you, you try and put it in a, in a single sentence, what you're looking at here is basically a bunch of 17th century warring tribes frantically and trying to and failing to confront a bunch of very globalized 21st century problems. So the international system is long, long overdue for an upgrade. I mean, it's, you know, we, we, we're still on 1.0, which was created in about 1912. Um, it hasn't even had a minor update since then, and yet the world has changed so, so, so dramatically. So collaboration is essential from that point of view. It's the only way we're actually going to fix anything, but it's just also more productive. And this is more of a cultural issue, but the simple fact of the matter is that if you get a bunch of people in a typical government, to tackle a typical policy issue. Almost by definition, they're not going to come up with anything very new because they come from the same background. And your culture defines to a scary extent what you're capable of imagining. And if you just throw open the windows in your policymaking room and you invite in people from half a dozen, even totally random countries, just because they might have an interesting view on whatever it is you're looking at, suddenly you find you get more ideas just from the collision of cultures. So. So coll collaboration and cooperation is not only necessary for the survival of the human race, it's also highly productive and highly rewarding instantly. So the, so the good news about all of these arguments is that no longer do we have to go to governments and beg them to have a think about climate change or have a think about poverty or inequality or migration because it's the right thing to do, because it's moral. You can't expect nations to be moral. They're not moral constructs. But what you can do now is you can go to them and say, this is in your direct, immediate, short-term economic interest. Mm. And that, that, those three sort of pillars of what you do talk about in the book are obviously really central to the whole idea of Simpol as well. I don't know um, how familiar you are with Simpol and, and John Bunsen. Oh, I know it well, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so, so just briefly, those three pillars. One is the idea of leveraging national self-interest. You know, so mm -hmm. so our argument is that you know this is this is going to help you get elected because otherwise you lose the simpol voting bloc. Um, yeah. The other one is that these policies are implemented simultaneously, um, and mm -hmm. the third is that um, yeah that, that we that we align the sort of national and the international interest that we, the dual mandate is really at the heart of it all. Um, so mm -hmm. what what do you think of simpol? Do you think it's um, viable in your view in, in the global community at the moment? Uh, that I couldn't possibly answer. I mean, I'm sure you have difficulty answering that yourselves. These things are, are hard, hard to, um, to read. One gets very little feedback um, from the international community because <laughs> the international community doesn't really exist. Um, and uh, we are certainly fellow travelers in the sense that our, our, basic, um, our basic description of what's gone wrong with the world and the major factors that need fixing before we can move forward are, are virtually identical. I find that enormously reassuring um, because if there are um, sensible, intelligent, uh, well-informed people um, pushing pretty much the same line, that's very reassuring. Um, whether simple will work, um, well, who knows? Uh, what, you know, what you're asking is a big ask. Um, it's, it's, it's logical. Um, and, uh, and obviously the influence of game theory is very clear in there. If people did it, it would be in their interest. But as we all know, making politicians change direction or change their views even slightly is enormously difficult because they are people who feel most of the time that they're only in that position of power um, by the grace of providence and at any moment they might slip. And that's why they're so conservative, whether or not they are politically conservative and so reluctant to change and so reluctant to try anything new because once they've got there, all they really want to do is stay there. Mm. Yeah, and you and you write very persuasively about the need for the sort of culture of governance to shift from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally cooperative. And there's this lovely quote that you say, uh, nations used to go to forth to make war. More recently, they've learned to go forth to do business, but from now on, they need to go forth to work, to repair and to, and to work together. Um, and so you talk about going from combat to competition to collaboration. Um, and it reminded me of um, an interview, the last interview I had actually in this series with a woman called, woman called Elizabeth Sartoris that talks about that cycle that you describe from combat mm -hmm. to competition to collaboration is not just a feature of human evolution. It's actually, it's been going on since the very first life emerged on earth. 
um, mm -hmm. and and that it seems to be a kind of repetitive cycle, and we are we are trying to make that final that final shift into the third phase. Mm. How interesting! I should listen to that one. Yeah, yeah, she's a cool woman, Elizabeth Sartoris. Um, mm. it's, it's it's that dynamic from yeah, it seems to be a cycle, and it sort of scales up in complexity as evolution carries on. Mm. Um, so you wrote that one of the consequence, consequences of the democratic systems we've evolved is to produce leaders whose minds microscope instead of telescope. So what exactly do you mean by that? And, and how do you think we can bring more long term thinking into our democratic systems? Well, basically, everything in the political system, both domestic and international, is turned inwards. Um, by the time a politician uh, has climbed the slippery pole uh, up to being head of government or head of state or cabinet minister, it's invariably as a result of them having focused all of their efforts and all of their attention on the minutely local. And very often what attracts them to politics in the first place is the minutely local. And that's absolutely fine, but it doesn't necessarily equip them for what happens when they become prime minister or president. When you become president or prime minister, you join the team that runs the planet, whether you like it or not. It's not written in the job description, but nobody else is doing it. And we so often find, I don't know whether you noticed, I run a little provocation sometimes called the global vote, which uh, enables people anywhere in the world to vote on the elections of other people's countries. Um, I'm running one for the US election at the moment. I just voted, yeah. Oh, ten, thank you. Ten guesses for who I picked. <laughs> I expect you picked uh, Joe Jorgensen, the, uh, <laughs> the libertarian candidate. Very close to my heart. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, the point behind this is obviously a serious one. Why is it that when it's election time and countries are picking their leaders, even if it's in a very internationally minded country like Sweden, the election issues and the election discussions, the whole framing is 100% domestic. Now, I don't despise that in any sense at all. And one of the main points I tried to make in the book is that there's no such thing as a localist and a globalist. You know, I'm pretty convinced that I'm a globalist, but actually I only have to look at what the localists are saying truly with an open heart and open ears for five minutes before I begin to understand, actually, that's not a different tribe. That's just me on a different day. And we're all a bit localist and a bit globalist, and we're all a bit left and a bit right. And we're all a bit conservative and a bit progressive. And the sooner we realize that and stop, stop dispatching ourselves into warring tribes, the sooner we would get things sorted. Um, this narrative that there's a sort of person who only cares about the very local, their own people, and there's a sort of person who seems to waste their time worrying about the whole planet and people they've never met. That narrative that we are enemies and we should spend our days screaming hatred at each other on social media is, as I said in the book, the most dangerous story in the world right now, because it makes fools of all of us and we should look out for it and call it out when we see it because it's bullshit. It's just not the way things are. Yeah, how extremely refreshing. I mean, I literally wrote an article literally the other day about this, about how the idea that left and right really should be supporting and constraining one another, you know, that, that you cannot have any functioning system of, 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 of governance or even anything without a, um, the impulse to try and maintain the gains made in the past, but also mm -hmm. the impulse to iterate and change and progress. And one, one without the other is either chaos or tyranny. You, you need them both to be supporting each other. And, and this idea that, um, that, that, I, that, that you, should, you need ideologies, that you need to package up policies or approaches um, into a basket and buy the basket. What, what, you know, who, what, what idiot invented that idea? Mm. And it's perfectly obvious that just in the way today, um, anybody under the age of 60 doesn't buy albums, they buy tracks. And the same is true of policies. I buy tracks, I don't buy albums. I don't want to buy the Conservative Party album or the Socialist Party album because yeah, yeah. I only like about two of the tracks on it. And, <laughs> and although, although people are tremendously shocked when I say it, I've practically never voted in an election in my life because I absolutely refuse to be branded as left-wing or right-wing or centrist or anything else. I know perfectly well that if I, if I pin my, my hopes for a better society on one of that bunch, they will let me down. And they'll end up doing a bunch of things that I don't agree with and I have to agree with because it's part of the package. This is insane. What a way to run a country. Yeah, and, and it's so, I mean, I always find it absolutely hilarious. If you tell me your views, for example, I don't know, let's say we're in America, your views on abortion. 
I could tell you, I could tell you that person's views on a, ten other issues yeah. to a sort of ninety percent accuracy, and that's that means clearly obvious that people are voting based on political tribes. They're not looking at each individual, and they're, they're they're lumping in their vote with whoever's around them and whatever's socially convenient to them. But having said that, it is interesting to note that most of those um, associated beliefs or values or whatever they are, they're not random. They weren't dreamt up by somebody in a random way. They do tend to reflect a personality type. Mm. So there's a certain amount of evolution there as well as direct manipulation. And that's why, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, it's very instructive to look at personality psychology and see the strong correlations between personality types and voting habits. Mm. It's not surprising that the same tribe of people will happily absorb the same views on uh, human rights, uh, women's rights, um, uh, religion, and so on and so forth, because they tend to collect like iron filings around a magnet on a particular personality type. And sometimes I think that actually the whole game of politics is literally nothing more than a personality contact, uh, contest. And I don't mean in the traditional way, simply that people vote for the, the man or they, the woman who they think they like most, but actually in the sense that we've got two personality choices. Which sort of personality are you most like? Are you somebody who is basically has a negativity bias that you see the world as a dangerous and threatening place and therefore the role of politics and the role of politicians is to defend yourself and your family against that threat? Or are, the, are you the other personality type who for whatever reason feels a bit more trusting and is quite interested in the idea of meeting new people and doing new things because they might prove to be better than the ones in the past. And broadly speaking, the whole of politics, the whole of humanity, all human behavior can be divided along those lines. And we think we're playing a very sophisticated game with our Bidens and our Trumps, but actually we're not. We're just playing out an old, old story of are you more scared or are you more adventurous? Mm, yeah, so interesting. Um, just to circle back to you know, the idea of, you know, you don't want a particular policy package, you want to examine everything individually. Um, have you come across the, an idea of called liquid democracy? And, and what do you think yeah. about more, essentially more direct forms of democracy? And, and, and have, yeah, have you thought about these things? Um, a couple of years ago, I tried to start a new country, um, as one does, <laughs> and um, it, was, it was going to be called the good country. Um, I'd done some research which uh, found that there were over 700 million uh, individuals in the world who I described as natural cosmopolitans, the sort of people who instinctively say that they're human first and a citizen of their own nation somewhat lower down the list, and that these would be the citizens. And it was irresistible to want to start a country because with 700 million people, you've got the third largest country on earth after India and China. So you could really kick some ass. I mean, you could wave goodbye to Abaz and change.org. You know, you'd actually be a country, um, a virtual country with no territory, but with loads of citizens and they were all going to pay they did start paying five dollars a year each in taxes which when we had the full complement of 700 million would have given us a budget greater than the gdp of sierra leone to play with um anyway it was a, a very interesting experiment um the reason i mentioned it was because um it, it, I, I designed it as being the world's first self-governing state um obviously you can't have a government that's a rubbish idea and so self-governing turned out to be a perfectly feasible and very exciting, but assisted by a great deal of technology, um, mainly artificial intelligence, which uh, enabled um, you to conduct conversations in real language, natural language in real time with an unlimited number of people, um, which meant that self-governing became feasible even with 700 million people. And one of the partners in the Good Country Project was Democracy Earth, um, who, as I'm sure you know, are doing lots of really interesting work on digital democracy using blockchain um, and also now cryptocurrencies as well. And we had a lot of fascinating conversations with them about the various forms of voting, liquid democracy being one of them, the transferable votes and all the rest of it. Um, and they provided the voting platform on which we could uh, also decide which policies we were going to pursue. So all of that is tremendously interesting, but I have to kind of um, physically cover my eyes and ears when these subjects come along, because otherwise it's so easy to get distracted and to go down a deeply fascinating, but rather dark, dark wormhole <laughs> that, you know, how do you actually change the voting system and stuff like that? Those kinds of changes 
you could, even once you've decided what the change ought to be, need to be, and should be, you could easily waste the rest of your life um, trying to persuade eight people to agree with you. Um, I had the same with the state of the world. I spent, wasted many, many happy hours with many other people trying to figure out the best forms of global governance. You and I could sit down and in an hour we'd cook up, you know, a hundred different variants on the theme of a global parliament and a, a reboot of the United Nations and reform of the multilateral institutions and all the rest of it. The problem with those conversations is that nobody has the authority to impose any of that. And so you're pretty much wasting your time. It ain't gonna happen because nobody has the power to make it happen, which is why I chose the route of cultural change rather than system change, because I think cultural change, although still very difficult, is more likely to happen. Within a country, it's different. You get and, the right uh, party in power, you could do it. I think a, a really useful the sort of framing device that I use a lot is the sort of three horizons of change. So you talk about horizon one being where we're at, Horizon mm -hmm. three being the utopian state that we want to get to, which could be all these lovely ideas like liquid democracy. But unless you can find a horizon two, which is actually mm -hmm. a practical, feasible step that could get us from here to there, that you can actually take people with you to horizon yeah. two, then then it's just pie in the sky. Um, yes. And um, yes, I had a question related to what you said, but I've forgotten. But if it's useful, it'll come back, I normally find. Um, so. Um, yeah, so you, you you worked with the Croatian government at one point, and they were mm. trying to sort of broadcast to the rest of the world that you know that we're we're um, we're out of communism, we're this open country, we're fair, we're democratic, we've got lots of strengths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. And um, you advised them to actually be net donors to the region, yeah. um, and by the sounds of it, it worked first of all. Um, but I was reminded of a conversation that I had very recently with a, a colleague of mine who who is in Kenya, is in Nairobi, and um, he he was expressing that basically reparations or not reparations sorry but um international aid mm. has a kind of um it it, it it sort of maintains or um uh persists a kind of power dynamic where yeah. where countries feel like they're receiving and, and therefore they kind of get stuck in a kind of position of inferiority let's say is not a very useful word to use but you understand what i'm saying yeah. so so what is your view on that and and how can we be do you think that's a valid point of view first of all mm -hmm. and and how do we kind of balance the, the desire to want to give you know um aid away to countries that need it but without kind of fixing them in the place of of, of someone who needs help yeah um, it was Slovenia, not Croatia, Croatia in that particular case. Um, I think the, um, the, the, the risks of um, collateral damage through aid are, are well known and often rehearsed. Um, in that particular case, in Southeastern Europe, it was relatively unlikely to do anything very seriously harmful to um, Slovenia's neighbours. Um, arguably, yes, it did, and arguably even was intended to somewhat fix them in the position of being uh, in, worse off than Slovenia. And that was part of the point. And that's one of the negative aspects of that particular initiative. But it certainly benefited Slovenia because what they were trying to do was to prove um, that they were a different sort of uh, Balkan country from their neighbors. Um, and in some respects that was rather, I see now that was rather aggressive because by giving them money, you were planting them in, in, in the position of being supplicants and they couldn't afford to refuse. But I mean, it, on balance, I think it's a net good, um, mainly because Slovenia has had the, the, the wit and the wisdom to stick to it, and they are acknowledged today as being one of the primary donors in the region. Um, and, you know, persisting with things, doing it consistently and sustainably over a long period is what really counts in all of these things. The, the, you know, one-offs are, are useless. In terms of aid, to um, the least developed countries, yes, it's it's very risky. Um, as we all know, it stimulates uh, corruption. Um, Dambisa Moyo has been very good on this subject, um, talking about the negative effects of aid. Um, it also uh, does harm to the images of those countries. Um, one of the things I speak about in the book is the fact that it's not happening quite so much anymore. It's gone a little bit out of fashion now, thank heavens, but aid celebrities like Geldof and Bono um, branding the whole of Africa as if it were one disaster area is extraordinarily bad for long-term economic uh, progress. Mm. Because if you've branded a country as a basket case, 
yeah, that's a pretty effective way of getting um, people to give it their spare cash, but there's no way they're going to invest in its economy or buy its products or hire its people or visit there as tourists because um, because the image is completely completely antithetical towards that. So yeah, you generate a bit of short-term charity, but you damage their prospects in the long run by branding them as failures. So these things are always more complex than they first appear. And the other problem with aid, of course, is that by providing um, uh, food and other forms of assistance way below any prices that any local providers can, can offer them, you, you basically destroy the, the local economy. Um, and in a sense, China is doing the same thing today in many African countries with its own version of aid, which is um, not quite as condescending, but in some ways equally damaging. Um, I actually quote in the book, there's, a, there's an African saying that the hand which receives is always beneath the hand that gives. Um, and I think that's, that's at the heart of it. This is not to argue that uh, disaster relief um, should be stopped. It shouldn't. Disaster relief is unfortunately still necessary and will remain so for some time. And there is also quite a lot of fairly persuasive research these days showing that the best thing you can do to cure poverty is to give people money. But you have to give people money, you don't give it to their governments. Um, and there are ways of doing that. We're getting better and better at doing it. But generally speaking, by far the best way to do it is to stimulate growth rather than uh, topping up um, pe people's funding, if you can possibly do it that way. I wrote a book way back in uh, oh, 2000 or something, which was called Brand New Justice, which basically argued that one um, long-term effective way of creating economic growth in least developed countries was by assisting producers and manufacturers in those countries to make their own brands and to export them instead of just uh, manufacturing basic products or delivering raw materials um, at break-even levels and getting poorer and poorer and poorer, they should actually own the brands and own the last mile to the consumer. Um, and I talked um, glibly in this book about how one day we might see the Nigerian Nike or the Colombian Coca-Cola. Um, and in a funny way, it started to come true. I mean, we're buying uh, what we would have then called third world brands all over the place now and hardly think twice about it. So that is um, because brand value accounts for an enormous percentage of all the wealth on the planet. And the fact that the first world does the branding and makes the huge profits and the second and third worlds do the manufacturing and the raw materials and earn absolutely nothing. Well, that's part of the problem and that's part of the, the part of what needs to change. Yeah, I remember you talking about um, the sort of Jamaican flag on Nike trainers and pointing out, well, shouldn't mm. shouldn't Jamaica receive some sort of kickback at least for that? You know, you're using their yeah. national image. Yeah. Um, I, I did remember what my question was, so obviously it was important. Um, and so, without going down the route of um, uh, yeah, sort of uh, systematizing our own plan for um, utopia, um, what what is wrong, or why isn't the UN um, effective, or and why does it fail to achieve? Um, you know, really important resolutions on the most pressing global issues? I think the UN is quite effective. I, I, I think we'd manage very poorly without it. Um, but I think that, um, well, we're all, we're all familiar with this tale, aren't we? It was invented uh, in a day very different from our own, um, to face challenges very different from our own, and under circumstances very different from the contemporary ones. And if, 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 you had the opportunity to redesign it today in 2020, you would do it very differently. There's no question about it. It wouldn't be just the elected or unelected official representatives of populations. Um, it wouldn't just be countries. The UN has come a long way in ensuring that there's some form of representation from civil society, from business. They've done a lot. Um, but in the end, uh, the UN's fundamental problem is that um, except for rare cases in the Security Council, it really doesn't have a big stick. Um, it's a membership organization and it only has the power that its members grant it. And of course, um, nation states being, as we know, are never going to hand a big enough stick to the UN that it could uh, do them any real harm when it beats them with it later on. And that's the fundamental problem with, um, uh, with, with the main forum for the international community being a membership organization. And that's the knot that somehow needs to be untied. I suspect that what we'll find over time is that um, other fora will emerge. It's interesting that the G20s and G7s and things like that are becoming more and more popular with leaders. And we'll find probably that there's a natural drift away from the General Assembly. 
um, and the other policy making forums towards more effective uh, shorter term, smaller, more wieldy ones, um, coalitions of the willing. Um, there's a horrible phrase that I use in the book, um, for which I apologize because it's very difficult to say and very difficult to type, entrepreneurial multilateralism, <laughs> um, whereby countries just take a very short term, very entrepreneurial approach to uh, global or even regional problems. And you just put together five countries on Thursday, not because the UN tells you to, but because you want to fix something. And you make up the rules and you do it, you work together and then you disband. And I think that that's the kind of entrepreneurial approach that we need these days. The UN will still be there, um, but its greatest, greatest value beyond any doubt is as an aid agency. And I think the world would be very badly off without it. Mm. Yeah, and just on that point of them not sort of having really a stick, you know, um, I mean, obviously that's something Simpol tries to resolve by, you know, if national politicians don't toe the line at the global level, then they lose the sort of national vote. Mm. Um, and, and the EU certainly seems to be, well, it seems to have bigger sticks, for, for yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and you, like me, you're a huge fan of the EU. Um, mm -hmm. Why, but then you, you talk about that it needs to sort of redefine its identity for relevance in the 21st century. It's almost sort of been so successful at mm -hmm. promoting peace and prosperity that, that people forget they need it. Um, <laughs> how do you think the EU can redefine its identity for relevance in the 21st century? I just think it needs it needs to pick a new cause, and I think it needs to focus on it and 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 rally people around it. I mean, the UN has been moaning and whining for as long as I can remember um, that it finds it hard to get young people engaged and hard to get people to vote when there are votes, um, and they always seem to think it's something to do with the way they present themselves. And every few years they go through this pitiful cycle of spending a whole bunch of money they don't have on some horrible American PR agency to do some horrible campaign to try and persuade people against their better knowledge that they love the EU. And, you know, it's just not the way that things work. You don't make people believe something new by telling them that they should believe it. It's very obvious what the problem is. The, the EU, uh, it hasn't done itself out of a job by any means, but it has done itself out of a brand in the sense that it now operates. It's part of the machinery of Europe. It sits there, it ticks along, it gets things done. Alexander Stubb, uh, the ex uh, prime minister of Finland, uh, who's always wonderful on Europe, was saying at a webinar we were both speaking on the other day that people should just accept what the EU is. The EU um, is something that swings into action rather slowly when there's a panic. And it is a crisis manager. That's what it's for. And people say, oh, my God, it's one crisis after another at the moment, the EU. Well, that's the whole point of the EU. It always has been about crises. That's what it's there for. But I do believe it could go a little bit further than that. Um, I believe that it could actually inspire people if it were pointing clearly the way towards some very clear uh, account of the future that we all want and all need. That's the way to engage people. And I don't hear that from the EU. I know what the values are. And I know and respect them for being fundamental European values, but I don't get anything from the EU that says we exist in order to ensure that whatever. And we're so lucky to live in an age where we're spoilt for choice, really, when it comes to picking the challenge that we want to spend our time and effort on. I mean, the European Union is, is, is it's a l'embarras du choix. It's got too many things that it could pick. Migration would be a obvious one for the European Union because it's responsible for it, it's implicated in it, it's suffering from it, it will benefit from it if it's done well. Um, why doesn't the European Union just own migration, all migration, and say that's our thing? By the way, in the background, we're still running the European Union. Mm. We're still running this extraordinary uh, group of nations. But the thing that we're committing ourselves to for the next X is whatever, or climate change, or whatever whatever, because Europe's got everything, whatever challenge you choose, the European Union can demonstrate that it um, is responsible for and uh, all of those, all of those aspects of every problem, responsible for them, has the best resources for fixing them, will benefit the most if it does fix them, will suffer the most if it doesn't fix them. That's what it needs to do. There needs to be a big conversation in Europe that says, for the next, let's do a five year plan, let's take a leaf out of um, Comrade Lenin's book. And we'll do a five-year plan and say our five-year plan is to sort out migration um, or to sort out climate change. The European Union actually could do one of those things. It's big enough. Mm. 
gosh, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? Um, and just on the on the topic of sort of you know inspiring visions or goals that that, that you know that we can hopefully all subscribe to. So there's underlying the idea of Simpol is a philosophy um, called conscious evolution, which I write about and make podcasts about. And it, broadly, it says that there's a direction to evolution, and and you can characterize that in one of a few ways. But one of them is that scales of cooperation tend to increase over the very long term. So we've gone from single celled organisms to multicellular organisms, etc. And in human history, it's been the same. We've gone from small bands to tribes, etc. cetera. Um, mm. Now, the issue that presents itself at the global level is that a lot of that, um, a lot of those expanding circles of cooperation have been driven by competition with an app group. So two mm. tribes competing with each other, larger tribe arrives on the other side of the mountain. And so therefore they're incentivized to cooperate. Mm. So at the global level, of course, there is no outgroup to drive mm. the emergence of a global cooperative. Do you see that as an issue? And, and if so, how can we resolve that? It is an issue. And one of the things I say on exactly this point in the book is that the only time the human race ever gets a sense of what that might feel like is when they walk out of the cinema on a sunny afternoon, blinking in the daylight, having just watched, uh, having just watched um, Independence Day uh, or something of that sort because for a brief moment there, you know what it feels like for there to be an outgroup, and, the, and, it's, and it's us humans together because the Martians are invading. And I sometimes wonder if um, perhaps we oughtn't to take a leaf out of the books of all the dictators and invent a common enemy in order to stir up that response, because if that's the only way it's gonna happen, then that's what we need to do. And maybe in a funny kind of way, Hollywood is as ever, the spirit or the conscience of the American people expressing, without even realizing that that's what it's doing, the desire, the need, the frantic need for a common enemy that we can all unite against. And that's what aliens are for. Now, the interesting thing is that for some reason, for reasons that we could talk about forever, climate change just hasn't been very effective at painting itself as the outgroup, as the systemic threat. We know it is, but it doesn't feel like one. The pandemic, on the other hand, if it doesn't sound too cynical, may have rescued climate change. Because the pandemic has been, continues to be, although at a frightful cost to human life and the organization of our societies, it has been incredibly useful in making a couple of things very obvious. First of all, that we humans have no special dispensation to survive. That was a shock to discover. I don't think many people really fully understood that until they looked at the evening news all over the world and suddenly thought, my God, we could all die. That's so important. Secondly, the pandemic has familiarized us with the sense that we are a single species inhabiting a single planet, occasionally combating a single set of, uh, of threats. And the togetherness that it's created, despite every effort of people like Trump to make us feel separate, the great move has been towards togetherness. Every evening you turn on the TV or you look at the news on your, on your browser and you see a million, million, million people suffering in the same way, fearing in the same way as you are all over the world. Never has it felt like one species inhabiting one planet quite as much as it does right now. We needed that. If it hadn't been the pandemic, then Lord knows. So I think what we need to do is we need to make use of that. Um, the pandemic for the time being is our outgroup. And that's what we need to fix our minds and our attention on in order to understand that we are, in fact, yes, one tribe. Mm. I wrote an article just at the onset of um, it called Our Little Blue Boat about, you know, using this boat metaphor that suddenly we realise that we are, that our fate is intimately tied to one another. And it's just, it mm. is, it's a fascinating and a magical world, isn't it? That just at the moment when we desperately need something like that, something like that comes along. Um, yeah, it's a shame it had to be something so awful, isn't it? But then, but then humanity has a sad, sad history of only realizing it's going the wrong way at a minute to midnight. Um, but that shouldn't lead to complacency because unfortunately when it comes to atmospheric CO2, 11.59 is about 20 minutes too late. Mm. Yeah, and it's, and it's that, I, I suppose that's another way of just uh, characterizing that sort of philosophy that we're trying to articulate at Simpol and, and, and myself at Conscious Evolution is that we need to make this transition from evolving only in response to threats and problems with sort of negative feedback to actually mm. do something which evolution has never done before, which is to look into the future, anticipate problems and evolve in response to our visions of a better future, not just in response to a set of problems. Because we want to. Yeah, because we want to, exactly. Yeah. 
because we have we have an imagination we can imagine how things can be better we can improve our definition of improvement ourselves and maybe maybe that is that is or well, i hope at least it's just something more inspiring that can lead us towards the for, you know into the future and that is what works i mean speaking as a as a long ago reformed ad man i know from experience that um, the most powerful driver of change is desire it's not fear um, and when you have al gore um, thumping his bible like an old testament prophet prophesying floods and famine unless we repent of our ways you just know that's not going to work it works on children but adults just cover their ears and go nya, 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 i can't hear you because they don't want to hear that kind of stuff mm. what you need to do is to do what um winston churchill great britain's wartime prime minister was so clever at he gave this wonderful speech on the eve of the Second World War where he described a beautiful landscape, which was him painting a picture of what the world would be like once we've got through the war. He talked about broad sunlit uplands, which is a nonsense phrase, but it just excites all English people, and <laughs> British people, with a vision of the future. And if you want people to move forward and you want them to get on board with something, that's the only way to do it. You have to drive them mad with a desire for a better future. Mm. Yeah, and explains why so much climate change activism has, has hit a wall, right? And, and it's one thing that I think at least partly Extinction Rebellion, at least in its initial sort of incarnation, was really good at doing, was, was you know, creating the fun and the positivity and the, and the kind of utopianism yeah. rather than just doom and gloom. And that's possibly where it went wrong. And it needs movements like that need to swallow their anger and convert it into something more useful because anger is unappealing to everybody and it pushes more people away than anything else. I often say to friends at the UN that the sustainable development goals, <laughs> I mean, it's been very useful in so many ways, but basically it's just 17 reasons to feel depressed. Um, <laughs> and the psychology behind that isn't tremendously effective. Yeah, God, honestly, I can't tell you how refreshing it is to hear um, someone like yourself saying these things because it's something, you know, I'm, all of these points about the need to swallow anger and to, you know, transcend our differences and to work together as a globe is basically a drum that I've been banging. Sometimes it feels quite on my own. So it's lovely to read your book. It's very nice to meet you. I have to say, you seem like you'd be an exceptionally fun person to sit next to at dinner. Um, and I strongly urge anybody to read the book because it is, it's not just important and interesting, but it's also, it's also good fun. And I'm going to end with a, with a, a quote, which I particularly liked. My view is that people in positions of power and responsibility have a dual mandate. They are responsible not only for their own people, but for every man, woman, child and animal on the planet. Not only for their slice of territory, but for every square inch of the Earth's surface and the atmosphere above it. And if they don't like the sound of this, they shouldn't be in a position of power or responsibility at all. Not for their country, their city, their town or even their own family. This is the new rule for life on Earth. So I wish you all the very best in that mission. And um, I, you know, I, I, I hope that, that that becomes as obvious to everybody else as it is to you and I. So thank you very much and best of luck. It's been a lovely conversation, Robert.